Thank you. Uh, so, who would like to know the secrets of powerfully presenting your project? Anyone interested in that? <laughs> Good. Good. We're in the right place. Then. Um, so, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I, uh, I lead a course in communication skills at the University of Cambridge. I also uh, run my own business communications consultancy, and I was a BBC TV and radio news correspondent for 20 years. So, first question I have for you this afternoon is why did I begin my talk the way I did? Rather than telling you in the traditional manner how magnificently wonderful I am, why did I ask you who would like to know the secrets of powerfully presenting their project? What did that do? Made you pay attention, hooked you from the very start. Why is that important? Does anybody here happen to know what the average attention span is in this busy modern world of ours? Prepare to be horrified. Zero, I'm going to have to work really hard with you then if it's zero, aren't I? Uh, yeah, go on. 45 seconds. I would do it like a game show. Lower, lower, lower. For those of a certain generation, lower. It's my best Bruce Forsyth. Any other guesses? 20 seconds. 20 seconds, lower still, I'm afraid. 10, 10 seconds, good. Who said that? 10 seconds. Very good. I hadn't told you up to this point, but you're going to be very excited to know we're going to have a little inter interactive session this afternoon. And those of you who answer correctly my series of intricate questions <laughs> will get some priceless Cambridge bling. <laughs> there you are. A Jesus College pen. Thank you very much. No charge. I'm going to tire myself out this afternoon doing this. OK, um, so it's about 10 seconds. This is disputed in the research. Lots of different viewpoints, but I've carried out my own research looking at presentations like this. And generally, if you don't hook the audience within the first few seconds, you've got these annoying distraction boxes in everybody's pockets and bags these days. They're off looking at their messages, their texts, their emails. So always remember, in all communication, it's really, really important to grab the attention of the audience right from the very start. No good having the best presentation, the best report, the best project in the world if nobody is listening to it. They've all tuned out. So the most important thing to think about when you're powerfully presenting your project, the most important thing to really spend time on is the start. So the first thing I'm going to do with you this afternoon in our half hour together is to look at the art of a striking start. And rather than me just telling you how to put together a really nice start, whether it's for a presentation, a talk, for a written report, I'm going to show you some examples of outstanding starts, and we'll learn the lessons from them. Okay? More Cambridge bling on offer for the first hand up with the correct answer. Okay? And just as an extra little test, I'm going to give you some classic literature, some children's literature, and a couple of pop songs. Let's see how we get on. So, striking start number one. You ready for this? Hands up. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Someone is desperate for bling. What is the answer? Pride and prejudice. Pride and prejudice, Jane Austen. Okay, spot on. Absolutely right. So I'm a good man for my word. I will give you some bling. I could probably do with an assistant to run around. Anybody want to volunteer and play along? No. <laughs> It'll just be me then. There you go. Priceless Cambridge bling. Okay, so that is a very famous, iconic opening line. But why? Why has it become so famous? Three points emerge from that for me. First of all, when you read an opening like that and the talk of single man, want of a wife, do you know immediately what sort of a story you're going to be reading? Is it a horror story, a crime story, a sci-fi story? No, it's a... Okay, so point number one, remember short attention spans. No time to mess around, straight into your story. Just like I started today. Who wants to know the secret of powerfully presenting your project? Okay. Point number two. I sometimes think of this as the dinner party question. Now, if you've been in the same position as me, you get invited to the occasional dinner party. With me, it's quite occasional, but that's another matter. And you shuffle through, and you don't know everyone. And within the first few seconds of talking to the people left and right of you, you get an immediate sense whether you're going to have a good evening or a really, really long one. Know that feeling? Yeah. So when you see someone writing with this level of ability, the observer's eye, the talent to sum up a universal truth with a bit of wry humor and only a few words, does Jane Austen pass the dinner party test? Someone you know it's worth investing your precious time in. So point number two, 
Set out your character or your authority from the very start. Make us feel your knowledge, your wisdom, your passion, whatever it may be. And point number three, possibly most importantly, when you read an opening like that, do you then think, I'm gonna chuck this book away, it's gonna be boring, or does it hook you into reading the next line and then the next paragraph and then the next page and then you're caught up with the story? So those three tests for your opening line, in only a handful of words, short and simple, and we'll explore more of that in a minute, straight to the heart of your story, remember short attention spans, give a sense of you, your character, your authority, your ability, make us want to find out more. And see how those lessons are reflected in other famous striking starts. We're gonna shift gear now and do a pop song. This is where I'm gonna find out who has got a misspent youth. <laughs> You're all gonna say, oh, I'm not saying now. Ready for this one? Load up on guns. I didn't even get the words out. That's a very misspent youth. What's the answer? How about that? Nirvana smells like teen spirit. Very good. You would have to be at the back, wouldn't you? There you go. Priceless bling. Okay. So, very different from Jane Austen, I think you'll agree. However, think about the three principles of a striking start. Does it go straight to the heart of the story? Anger, teenage rebellion? Yes. Does it give you a sense of the authors hitting out against the system in that youthful, angry way? Yes. Does it make you want to find out more? Yes. So very different, interestingly, same principles emerge. Okay, for we of the older generation, another gear change, another pop song, this time from the 1960s. Hands up for this one. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Sound of silence. Sound of silence, Paul Simon, very good. For a bonus point, anybody know what it's supposed to have been written about? Oh, I got you. Sorry? Depression? Kind of, yeah. Um, it's thought to have been written about the assassination of President Kennedy. So the extinguishing of that beautiful voice of light and hope in 1963. Straight to the heart of the story. Oh no, we're back into the darkness of what went before, the loss of Kennedy. A sense of Paul Simon and his character, his authority. What a writer. Just a handful of words, but so beautifully done. Economy of expression. Makes you want to find out more. And finally, possibly my fa favorite opening line, absolute beauty, hands up for this one. All children except one, grow up. Good, Peter Pan, yep, absolutely right, okay. Now isn't that lovely, six words, one clause, straight to the heart of the story, the boy who never grows up, you look unbelievably pleased to have that. <laughs> straight in the bin. <laughs> the boy who never grows up, J.M. Barry showing you he can write. Just a handful of words makes you want to find out more. Isn't that amazing? So when you think about presenting your project, whether it's in a talk, whether it's in a report, think really carefully about your start. If you can hook the reader or the listener or the audience from the start, you're winning from the beginning. And that's always a good place to be. That was a little esoteric, so let me translate that into something which may be more useful for you. A company in Cambridge I work with, we do some really, really good science. This is how we start their talk when we're pitching for investment partners or customers. This, I hope, will then reflect how the lessons can be applied in your everyday work. Our product could be to people with MS what insulin is to diabetics. Straight to the heart of the story, establishes Sue, who's the chief exec, her credibility, makes the audience want to find out more because that big, bold, authoritative statement. And just one further point, the bit I put in yellow. When you're doing a talk, when you're presenting, you should introduce yourself. It's only polite, after all, but you don't have to do it at the very start. With all due respect, your name is unlikely to be the most interesting thing about you. Okay. Hook the audience, take a beat pause, introduce yourself and go into your story. Okay? So that starts. That starts. Pay particular attention to starts. They are so, so important. Now, question for you, and I'm not giving away any bling on this because it's too easy. If the start is the most important part of presenting your project powerfully, what do you think is the second most important part? Oh, very good, absolutely. I love working with smart people. Okay, so the end. On the simple logical basis that the last words you leave your audience with are therefore 
the most likely to be remembered. But also, on the basis, there is some theory behind this, something called the peak end rule. I won't do theory with you because it's a bit boring. It's not what we're here for. But the theory says that the two parts of an experience we tend to remember the most are the peak of it and the end of it, the peak of it. And we're going to do the peak in a minute when we come to some of the content of your project. Okay, so how do we do endings? For this, I'm going to show you the start and end of two iconic speeches. Slightly different, but just to show you with the start that the starts conform to the three principles we discussed, but then see how the speeches end because we can learn an important lesson about endings from the beginnings. So yet more priceless Cambridge bling on offer. I'm not sure I brought enough. I might have to be buying drinks. To, don't, don't, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Okay, uh, so hands up. Identify the start of this famous speech. And I'll give you a clue. These are both American speeches. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition. Have you, you've had a pen already. Is this the intellectual table over here? And the speech is? Gettysburg Address. We didn't hear that. All right, we're not cheating. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address. Fill your boots. Go on. So, Abraham Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address. Going back to the start, straight to the heart of the story, yes, the battle for freedom. Sense of the man, the character, yes, passion, pride and principles. Make us want to find out more, yes. So how does the speech end? And what lessons can we learn from it? It goes like this. This nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Three points. First of all, as so often in life and books and films and stories and presentations and reports, the end reflects the beginning. So he comes back to his fundamental message, his core story about freedom, and he repeats it at the end. The end reflects the beginning. So he sums up his story, but on top of that, he does so memorably. In this case, with the lovely rhythm of threes, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Threes are always memorable. We like threes. Human brains are pattern-seeking machines. We like threes. The other point is he ends it emphatically. He doesn't sort of tail off into nothing. Shall not perish from the earth. Durham. Okay. So mirroring starts, the ends, sum up your story, do so memorably, with a little rhetorical trick or trick of words if you can, do so emphatically. Now see how those lessons are repeated in possibly the most iconic speech of all time. More bling on offer, starts like this. I'm happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. 60s. Yeah. Martin Luther King, and it's the iconic I have a dream speech. That is how it begins. Thank you. Straight to the heart of the story. Sense of the man's character and authority makes you want to find out more. Does that speech end by summing up his story memorably and emphatically? You bet it does. When we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, We'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Sums up the story memorably and emphatically. I still get a shiver, and I've read that out more than a few times now. Isn't that magnificent? So endings, sum up your story. Do so memorably and emphatically. And again, just to reflect what I do with Sue and Lift Nano in Cambridge, how do we sum up their pitch? So, to give hope to so many people where before all hope was lost, come partner with us on this truly profound project. Thank you. Sum up story memorably and emphatically. And just two more points for when you're giving a presentation, you're doing it as a talk. Come partner with us on this truly profound project. It's your call to action. Call to action normally comes at the end of a talk. It doesn't have to. There are no rules in communication, but it often will. 
Every talk, everything is an opportunity. So always consider putting a call to action in, whether it's just sign up to our newsletter, look at our website. It might be fund our work, call to action. And the final thing, the thank you, is a very straightforward way of telling your audience you have finished. I don't know if you've been in the same position as me, but sometimes you go to these improvised music recitals and the group are playing away. And I always try and be kind and supportive and it looks like they've finished and so I start clapping and then they start up again. And I look like a right wally. You've probably seen talks where someone's done a good job and it gets to the end and they say, and so that, that's it, I think. Um, oh no, there was something, no, hang on. Yeah, oh, there was no, oh yeah, that's it. End emphatically, and the way to tell your audience you've done is with a great big thank you. Jobs are good, okay? So starts and ends, two most important parts of any form of presenting your project, however you do it, okay? Guess we better look a little bit at the content. Now we've got the bookends, otherwise it's gonna be a very, very short presentation, isn't it? Uh, now I want to introduce you to one of my favorite acronyms in the world of communication. And uh, because I'm feeling generous and you're all being very nice and playing along with my silly ways of doing things, let's have a little game of guess what the acronym stands for. Does anybody know the acronym KISS in communication, what it means? Keep it um, simple, stupid. You're talking to me. <laughs> keep it simple, stupid, yeah. Um, keep it simple, silly, if we're being more polite, but uh, keep it short and simple is another variation. I think this, this table is winning all the bling. You're a double bling winner. That never happens. Okay, uh, keep it simple, silly. Why am I showing you that rather traumatic slide, or traumatic for those of us who didn't do very well at mathematics anyway? Um, extreme example, but the point is this. That is a famous image from an American university in the 60s. And of course, what that lecturer has produced is fine for that group because they are all experts in maths or physics or astronomy or whatever it is they're doing. However, imagine that a group from the local council had been invited into the university to hear about the great work it was doing, and they just sat through an hour of that. They're going to be completely bamboozled, aren't they? So an extreme example. But the point being is that you are all brilliant researchers in your field. You are used to talking the language of your job, jargon, if you like. Every trade has its jargon from law to finance to media. We get into the mindset where we just speak it without thinking. Sometimes you have to stop and say, if I'm gonna present this, I need to make sure everybody can understand, so I have to translate. Translate what I'm gonna say. So when you're putting together any form of presentation or talk or report, who is my audience? If it's a scientific audience, okay, you can talk more scientific. If it's not, you may have to interpret, translate what you're talking about. So what you want, Always think for good communication, and this is so difficult to get across, particularly in Cambridge, because it goes against what people are taught at school and in business and when they think they're being clever. You don't want tech talk or smarty pantsness or jargonification. Plain and simple language is by far the most powerful form of communication. Okay? And I'll set you another challenge here. I'll give you three examples of jargon to translate. See if you can help me with it. The first is, anyone here from the East End of London? No, good. The first is Cockney rhyming slang. Most of you will know Cockney rhyming slang originated in the East End, the idea being to replace words with words that rhyme. Okay, if you can talk this way in East End of London, because most people understand it. If you are outside of there, you may have to translate. So here's your challenge. Help me with this one. Translate the Cockney rhyming slang as a form of jargon. Okay, me old china plate, I've come into some bees and honey, so let's have a bubble bath down the rubber dub. Break it down with me. Okay, me old china plate. Good, okay mate, I've come into some money, so let's have a laugh down the, bingo, very good. You all get a pen. So, in the East End of London it would be fine, but we have to translate it in order for wider understanding and good communication. Okay, the next one I step onto dangerous ground. Is anybody here a manager? They're not going to admit to it, are they? <laughs> Would you like to translate some management speak with me? I used to love management speak at the BBC. It was about the only thing that kept me sane going through those awful corporate meetings. All the stuff you've heard about the Beeb, it's all true, <laughs> but worse. Okay, 
Help me with this management speak. I want a deep dive to self-source as a magic bullet which is both holistic and actionable. <laughs> Translate it into simple English for me. I want a deep dive. What? Th think carefully, yeah. That wasn't so hard, was it? Self-source. We're going to self-source something, we're going to... Yeah, create, come up with an idea. A magic bullet, also in an common parlance as a solution, yes, which is both holistic and actionable. It, yeah, it works, simple as that, yeah. Effective and it works, something like that. I'd like you to think carefully and creatively to come up with an effective, comprehensive and practical solution. How much harder was that? And more importantly, how much less of a wally does it make the person look? <laughs> Management speak. Final one, classic problem I have in Cambridge is brilliant people come out with great innovations which make terrific businesses, but they have no idea how to communicate it. So one such business asked me for help because they thought they had a really good service and they didn't understand why no one was buying it. Maybe you can help me with why no one was buying it. Are you not any good at maths? You're going to love this one. Utilizing Brownian motion models, non-regime switching data universes, multiple quantitative data source complex clustering, and characterization algorithms, we forecast equity shifts. How did I translate that to help the business cut through? Any guesses? You want to see how I translated it? We use advanced math to call the stock market. And when I said that to them, they said, oh yeah. <laughs> and guess what? They're doing all right now. OK, so serious point. We all get into the mindset of the way we work, the language we speak, the jargon. Just before you put anything together, you present your project, think about can it be understood. OK, sometimes you need to translate. This is one of the strangest things about communication. Because we think it'll make us look clever if we use big words and jargon, it doesn't. Plain and simple language, much more effective. Okay. So related to that, I now want to cover possibly, probably, I'd say my favorite concept in the entire world of communication. This is absolutely gorgeous. I just love it. It gets a big build up. What is it? Don't put in too much info, say what you need and stop, no, no, illustrate, don't overwhelm, don't go on and on, no, 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 waffle, waffle, waffle. What I'm trying to say is less is more. You heard of the concept of less is more? You can make more impact by saying less, doing less work. What's not to like about that? Less is more comes back to the basic principle that we only have a certain amount of memory capacity, processing capacity, just like a computer. We can't take too much in. So when you're putting together a way of presenting your project, think about the most important things you need to say and stop. Okay? Less is more. Let me give you an example of how less is more now. I would like to ask for a volunteer to come up to the front. You know me by now, what could possibly go wrong? The volunteer should be someone who's pretty good at catching. Come on. Otherwise, I should pick on someone. Come on, let's have a volunteer. Come on, then. Was that like a running for the door, or was it genuinely a volunteer? OK. I'll tell you what, just to make this even more fun, we'll do it on the stage. Come on. <laughs> You weren't expecting this today, were you? OK, so less is more in action. Stand there for me, please. It's all right, they're not as bad as they look, honestly. They're OK. Right, I have brought from Cambridge all the way some ping pong balls. Oh, good. Right. Ready for this? You know what's coming? You ready? Uh -huh. Oh, God, it's not going well already, is it? Stop. Ready? Catch. Oh. You said you could catch. <laughs> OK. So what went wrong? Can I sit down now? No. <laughs> You're up here for the whole of the duration of the talk now. OK, so what went wrong? What too went wrong? Many. Too many. OK, far, far too many. You couldn't take it in. So let's repeat the experiment. Ready? Mm -hmm. Catch. One, two, three. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> you can go and sit down now. Do you want a pen? Not really, you want counselling, but you can have a pen anyway. 
So silly example, but if you throw too much at people, they can't take it in. Okay? So keep the messaging load light, drip feed it, and you'll make more of an impact. Less is more. But don't just take my word for it. Don't believe what I'm just saying, because less is more has many great examples in history. We've already mentioned this gentleman, and I want to come back to him, because he's got a great lesson for us. Anybody recognize him? Yep, Abraham Lincoln. OK, so that's Abraham Lincoln doing the Gettysburg Address. Pretty much everybody has heard of the Gettysburg Address. It's famous and fated. It's an iconic speech. Because it is so celebrated, people tend to assume the Gettysburg Address went on for a long time. Anybody know how long the Gettysburg Address lasted for? What do you think is the minimum amount of time he could have spoken for to make such an extraordinary impact, one that echoes through history? How long? Four minutes. Four minutes? Any other guesses? You think you can make an impact in four minutes? Any other guesses? Eight minutes? Any others? Three. Three. Lower. Any other guesses? Two minutes. Two minutes. The Gettysburg Address lasted probably for around two minutes. We can't tell you how long exactly, because there was no one there with a stopwatch timing Abe. But we do know how many words there were, because there are copies of it in various learned institutions. Prepare yourselves for a shock. The Gettysburg Address contained around 270 words. 270. In other words, about half a page of A4. It took him probably less than two minutes to deliver, yet it went down in history. Why? And this is the key lesson. Not because of the word count, but how much the words counted. You've seen the start, you've seen the end, the bit in the middle was pretty good too. Think about what you need to say, say it well, say only what you need to say and stop and you will make more impact. Less is more. Okay. Interestingly, less is more does not just work with words, it works with images and data as well. When you're putting data together, you should use the minimum amount you need to make the point you're trying to make, another common trap. Let me show you how less is more works with images, pictures. So here we have a kid's picture, the like of which many long-suffering parents have on their desks, and an artist. Anybody recognize the artist? Rothko, yeah, Mark Rothko, you got one of these? Anyone got one of these? You'd be my friend for life if you got one of these. Okay, that's a Mark Rothko. The kid's picture, if I put it on eBay, probably get a mocking bid of 10p if I was lucky. How much did the Rothko sell for at auction? What would you give me? Figure in dollars. Would you, let's have an auction. What would you give me for the Rothko? How much for the Rothko? Come on, don't be mean. How many? Five million? Higher. 100 million. I like you. Okay, drinks on you tonight. 100 million, that's good. Higher than 100. I know. You ready? $186 million. $186 million for the Rothko. Okay? Less is more. Squiggle, 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 color, color, color. <coughs> Minimalism. Less is more. Okay? So remember the art of less is more. It's really, really powerful. Really powerful. Say what you need to say and stop. And that's probably all you should need to do. OK, so we're coming towards the end of our time together, which then brings me to the last thing I want to mention. And this is on the content of your project when you're presenting it. You will know what to include in terms of data and analysis and conclusions. That's your department. You're smart scientists. But there is one area which is all too often forgotten if you really want to powerfully present your project. This is a symphony of so much of our lives. It is the basis of all books, films, TV box sets. It's something we do endlessly and we always underappreciate it. What am I talking about? Storytelling. Storytelling. But breathing helps in life as well, I agree. <laughs> In fact, I'll take that away when I go back to Cambridge. Good life tip, keep breathing. Excellent. <laughs> Storytelling. I think we overlook it because we kind of associate it with being kids and entertainment and watching telly and reading books, and yet it is so powerful. Why do I show you this slide? 
because it illustrates the power of storytelling. In the old days, before books, how was knowledge and wisdom and information handed down? The elders around the campfire telling stories. Stories are amazing. They light up our minds in ways that mere facts cannot. Have you noticed when you're watching an action sequence in a film, you start to twitch and fight it out with the characters? That's the story, lighting up your mind. And when it gets sad, you start to cry. That's the story, lighting up your mind. That's what stories do. And they are so fundamental to our way of life. There's been research on this. Does anybody know what percentage of our day-to-day -day conversations are thought to be stories? It's quite surprising. Any guesses? I've frightened you into submission with my games now. Well, nobody wants any more Cambridge bling. <laughs> it's about 65%. It's almost two-thirds of your day-to-day -day conversations are stories. And if you think about it, something happens interesting at work that day, you go home, you tell your family, ah, oh, something happened, you wouldn't believe this, and you tell the story. Or at work, you have some interesting finding, something happens, you tell your colleagues over the water cooler or a coffee, you tell the story. Stories are absolutely fundamental. So when you're presenting your project, if you can, try and find a way of getting a story in. It has to be relevant for what you're doing, of course. But stories can make the point far more powerfully than mere facts and data. I always say when I'm teaching this, facts fade, but stories stick. OK, facts fade away, but stories stick. And just to finish our time together, let me give you an example of that. I left the BBC to devote my few remaining years of reasonable intellect and energy to teaching in Cambridge because I know the impact that a good teacher can have. So I might say to you now, as a statement of fact, you should always respect teachers because they can do amazing things. And you would look at me and say, oh yeah, okay, fair point, Simon, I probably should remember that. I should respect teachers, they can do amazing things. But will you remember it? Will you carry it in your heart? Not at all, not at all, will you? So let me tell you a story instead. In order to do so, I'm gonna to have to introduce you to a horrible child. So there at the back is me, age 14. If you don't recognize the pose, we're trying to recreate the cover of the Who's My Generation album. <laughs> I guess it seemed like a good idea at the time. You can probably see from looking at me that I'm reeking with attitude. And that's absolutely true, because I was a horrible kid at school. In fact, I was a horrible kid all around. I was being suspended and excluded from school for fighting and disrupting and vandalizing and just being a real tear away. I kept disappearing from home. I gave my parents no end of problems. I was arrested by the police several times for my behavior. At that age, I was perfectly close possible to making a complete hash of my life. I could easily have just gone off the rails and made nothing of it at all, probably prison, maybe a few dead end jobs if I was lucky. That was the fate which was waiting for me until one day. I was walking down the corridor in my ordinary state school on the Sussex coast doing my tough kid with attitude, Simon Strutt, when out of a classroom jumped two teachers, Nigel Waugh and Jerry Lewis. You'll see why I remember the names so well in a moment. And they grabbed the horrible young me, pulled me into the classroom, locked the door behind us, and drew the curtains. I stopped being cocky at that point because I thought I was about to be beaten up. These were big guys, Nigel, an athlete, Jerry, a rugby player. This was the mid-1980s. It was a savage time. That was perfectly possible. I could have got a real kicking. But actually, what they did was they sat me down and gave me a, a five-minute grilling. How I was stupid because I had brains and talent and wit and sometimes charm and I was eloquent and I could be thoughtful and I could lead and I could create and I could do so much with my life or I could do what I was on course to do and throw it all away. And they concluded by saying, we decided to do this with you because we thought you were worth a chance. We see something in you. Now go out there and prove us right. Clear off, kid. And I remember coming out of that classroom absolutely spellbound because nobody had ever done anything like that for me in my life before. And from there, I did do better. And I, I went on to do OK at school. And I went to university. 
And then I joined the BBC and I travelled to amazing places, meeting extraordinary people, covering remarkable events. And then I started writing books, and I've had about 20 published, and then Cambridge and becoming a course leader at one of the most extraordinary universities in the world. And here is the punchline. I don't think any of that would ever have happened if it hadn't been for that five-minute intervention of Nigel and Jerry all those years ago. So today, whenever I teach, whenever I'm privileged to do talks like this, I always think back on those two guys, and I hope I'm fulfilling the wonderful legacy that they left me. So what will you remember? My statement, you should respect teachers because they can do remarkable things, or my story. So when you're presenting your project, why are you doing what you're doing? What are you hoping to achieve? Who are the people you've met along the way? What can you change in the world? Your science is critical, of course it is, I understand that. But your stories, your humanity, your heart, that's critical too. So always try and get a story in, okay? There's a story in all of us, and often thousands. And the final thing I will say, because I've come to the end of my time, and you've got more important things to do than listen to me, is on the subject of storytelling. When I was asked to come and speak to you today, I had absolutely no hesitation in saying, yes, I would be delighted to do so. And this is no flannel. I consider it a great privilege and honor to be here. And the reason for that is I'm well aware of your work, but many years ago, when I was at university, I had a girlfriend called Jo. And we were together for a while, and I was lucky enough to be invited to her house and Sunday lunch and a lovely family, quite a few of them around the table. And it was a great atmosphere. And then we finished lunch, and then the phone went outside. It was in the days of the old-fashioned phones, which actually had cables. You know those? Remember those? And suddenly the atmosphere changed. Something changed, and I didn't know what it was. And Jo went to answer the phone, and she started having a chat with her gran. And it was classic stuff. What have you been doing? What's the weather like? That sort of thing. A five-minute conversation, she came back, and about a minute later, the phone went again. And another member of the family got up to have a chat with Gran and went through exactly the same thing. And that happened three, four, five more times. And of course, Gran had Alzheimer's disease. And she was going through what you all know far better than me so many people go through. So the final thing I want to say is it's an absolute pleasure and privilege being able to talk to you. I hope I've been able to help you a little bit in thinking about how you can communicate the critical work you do. And I wish you all the very, very best in your incredibly important work combating such a dreadfully cruel scourge of our society. Thank you. Thank you. If you, just, if you don't mind me just adding, um, there's all my contact details there. I genuinely mean if I can help any of you with any of the work you do, anything communication-wise, there's my Cambridge email. I'm on Twitter as well and on LinkedIn. Do connect with me. I love hearing from people I've worked with. And if I can help you or have helped you, please get in touch. It would be lovely.